And I think Auschwitz was a wonderful classroom to really learn how not to ever allow to be a victim. I was victimized. It's not my identity. It's not who I am. It's what was done to me. That's important. Hola, soy Madeli Bejar y esto es Tiene que haber algo más. ¿Alguna vez te quedaste pensando que tiene que haber algo más en la vida? En el podcast analizamos la historia de profesionales de todo el mundo que se transformaron para estar alineados con sus valores. Contamos historias y desarmamos cómo lo hicieron. Entérate el detrás de escena mis recomendaciones uniéndote al correo semanal en tiene que haber algo más .com correo. Si escuchas el podcast y también sos un profesional inconformista, puedes unirte a la comunidad. Es un espacio donde nos ayudamos entre todos para acompañarnos y contarnos nuestro progreso y aprendizajes. En tiene que haber algo más .com barra comunidad puedes ver cómo funciona todo esto. Esta semana es diferente. Conseguí una invitada que valía tanto la pena contar su historia que hasta rompimos el formato y por primera vez la conversación es en inglés. Conversé con la doctora Edith Figger, que probablemente la conozcas por su libro La bailarina de Auschwitz. Te cuento quién es ella. Edith Figger era una adolescente cuando en 1944 padeció uno de los peores horrores que ha visto en la historia de la humanidad la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Sobrevivió al campo de concentración en Auschwitz y huyó a Checoslovaquia para terminar en Estados Unidos. Allá se doctoró en psicología y conoció a su mentor, Viktor Frankl. Fue protagonista de documentales, es profesora de la Universidad de California y tiene una clínica en La Joya, California. Ella tiene 95 años y vive en Texas. Esta conversación es muy, muy importante porque ella no dejó que las circunstancias la definan y tiene un optimismo admirable y ella se transformó para tener una vida plena a pesar del trauma que vivió. Para que sea más fácil, incluimos los subtítulos en español para seguir la conversación. Búscalo en YouTube, con video y en redes sociales. Y cuando termines, contame qué te pareció el capítulo. Hello, Dr. Edith Eager. Welcome to Tiene que haber algo más. It's such an honor to have you here. How are you, you today? It's very mutual. Thank you. Um, let me tell you that I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I have my book here. Uh, everything is remarked. Um, so I want to I wanna start by asking you, yeah. I want to start saying that it's so inspiring that you published The Choice at 90 years young. I want to I wanna know what happened that you decided to write this book and make it public. Many, many years people asked me to write a book to write a book, and I would automatically say, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. And then finally, Philip Zimbardo from Stanford called me, and he said that he did research, and the people who survived and are famous are all men, and they need a female voice. So that's how the choice is a female voice of Viktor Frankl. That, that is absolutely true. Uh, we need these uh, role model women to tell women, us how women, to ask. Women talk from the heart. Men talk from their minds. And I think, I think if we can do both and we can have good conversation, not competition or domination. Definitely. Um, how was the, the behind the scenes process for you to write this book? I think it has a lot of tears in it. Uh, look at every page, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, something I highly recommend for people not run away from. It's okay to cry. You know, what comes out of your body will not make you ill. What stays in there does. Mm. See, what we do with anger, we either vent it, And that's why it's good to scream it out. Uh, many people are repressing it, and I, I am one of those. I didn't want to see or talk about Auschwitz for close to 20 years. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's very, very good to, to cry, to scream, and... Um, just recognize that 
I have a story, but I'm not as my story. Mm -hmm. Did you expect anything for this to happen? Like the both books had such success, success that it got translated to so many languages in so many countries. Did you see this coming? No, uh, I I am not that wise at all. But I know that a girl who was with me on the latrine found the mirror. And that was very unusual. And so she showed me the mirror. But a few minutes later, she said to me, I am at Marie Antoinette's boudoir and I'm fixing my hair. You know, she, we were all blah, uh, bored. Um, so that, that I thought that was lovely how to turn tragedy into triumph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and how did you decide to write a second book, um, The Gift? The after second book came because people told me that the first book is okay, but I need something more personal and more practical. Mm. Practical. So the second book, you're going to get a chapter and then tell you what to do about it. So it's more practical that you can use it and for change, because if you don't change, you don't grow. Change is synonymous with growth. So I hope that you are the ambassador uh, uh, in a whole wide world to guide people from victimization to empowerment, from darkness to light, hmm. from tragedy to wonderful, wonderful victory. Yeah. Um, I'm curious that Viktor Frankl was, was your mentor. I want to know yes. how, how was that experience and what did you learn from him? Well, you know, when I read my search for meaning, which was the middle of the night, someone gave me a, a book at the school at the University of Texas. And so I wrote an article called Victor Frankl and me, you know, little old me. And one day I got a letter that he wants to meet me in San Diego at the International University. And that was wonderful. That was very, very wonderful. He was in his 70s and he was climbing mountains, learning how to fly airplanes, you know, a true Renaissance man. And uh, he was my mentor and colleague as well. I did a keynote address for his 90th birthday at the, at the conference of logotherapy. That's, that's impressive. Um, what, what do you think you learned from him over those years? I think what I learned from him is very existential. It's about purpose and meaning in life. And uh, I many times was asked, how do you want to be remembered? And I want to be remembered as someone who was lucky enough to get out of Auschwitz. But Auschwitz was a schoolroom and I learned how to cope with the unexpected and the unanticipated. Mm -hmm. I remember I was praying actually for the guards who had to wear the uniform and calling me a pariah. And, uh, you know, you're not born to hate, you learn it. About this, that this you said, I love that there's the, the phrase in the book that it says that uh, in Auschwitz, there wasn't Prozac to numb feelings. Um, how did you manage the uncertainty that things could change very fast during those years? You know, my daughter called me one day. Her husband got the Nobel Prize in economics, so they travel all over the world, and he happened to be in Auschwitz. And it was very cold, 
I believe it was November or December. And she says, Mom, I'm wearing a fur coat and I'm wearing boots. How did you do it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was an interesting question because, you know, we had a little something on. Uh, and you, you just do the best you can. I wanted to live so badly because my boyfriend told me I have beautiful eyes and, and pretty hands. So I always wanted everybody to tell me about my eyes, about my hands. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Um, How were you able to separate what happened to you from your identity? Um, There is one thing we cannot change is the past. I, I ask people, don't call me a shrink call me stretch, you know, you you stretch your comfort zone in a place like that, because you find out that if you wait for something to happen outside of you, uh, that's not really a good idea. So I think I developed my inner resources and hope in hopelessness. And instead of saying yes, but yes, and this is temporary. Yes, I don't like it. It's inconvenient and it's temporary and I can survive it. Mm-hmm. You never give up hope. Yeah. And I feel like your story is is such an example of what can you do with the circumstances that happen to you. And I know that you have been helping others and your patients for years And I want to know what have you identified as a common mental prisons that we all have? I think the common mental prison that we underestimate ourselves, that uh, we are much kinder than we think we are. I think it's good to be a good parent to you. Uh, Two questions I have. One is, when did your childhood end? And if you're a child of a survivor, you end up parenting your parents because you come to America and, and, and you don't know tuna fish, you don't know uh, peanut butter, you don't know many, many things. So the child uh, will become the parent's parent. So the first question would be, when did your childhood end? And the second question is interesting. Would you like to be married to you? Mm, I like that one. Yeah, I do too. That's such a good question. You're, you're fun to be around. You, you're a good conversationalist. And write down on one paper everything you appreciate. And then write down on another paper is what you resent. See, my husband was very punctual, and when we went to a party, he was already in a car waiting for me while I was prettying up. But I knew that if I have to take a plane at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning, he was there. So what you resent one time, you can appreciate another time. Mm. Yeah. I, uh, when I was reading uh, your book, there's this story that I really loved when your sister gets her her, head shaved and instead of pointing to what she lost, you mentioned how beautiful her eyes were. Where, Where do you think this optimism and mindset that you have comes from? Because it's on, it's really incredible what you did. One of the things that I can tell you that I had two beautiful sisters, Magda played the violin and Clara uh, played, uh, I'm sorry, Clara played the violin, Magda played the piano. And the two of them were known because uh, Magda was accompanying Clara and people didn't even know I existed. So I was kind of the lost child. 
And I think I spent a lot of time alone. And that prepared me very much, very much for Auschwitz, that I was able to connect my mind with my heart and knowing that I don't like it's inconvenient, it's unexpected, it's unanticipated, and it's temporary, and I can survive it. So get rid of the yes, but, and say yes, and. Hmm. That shows um, how strong of a mind you have to go through this experience. The woman of strength is you, and you're a role mother, because young people really need role models like you. And like yourself. Yes. Yes, Um, I think look in the mirror every morning and be really happy that you are just say Ada girl. That is so so nice. Um I know that we 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 don't have to go through such difficult stories like yours to have challenging things happening to like day to day lives and there's a lot of people denying successes uh, with perfectionism. I want to know how you dealt with survivor's guilt, because I'm sure we all can relate to this. I'm going to tell you one thing first. Mm -hmm. A woman came to me and told me that she was inappropriately touched, but she doesn't want to tell me because I was in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And my answer was to her, In Auschwitz, I knew the enemy, and you didn't. And I think it's very, very important to really look at your feelings and uh, not to lie about that. It's okay to be angry. Anger is not a primary emotion underneath of, of anger is, it's an F word called fear. Mm-hmm. I think it's good to write down all your fears from the least anxiety producing to the most anxiety. And you can knock them off because you were not born with fear. Fear and love does not coexist. That's such a great idea. Uh, I love that that exercise. Um, I would love to understand how was the process that you decided to go back to Auschwitz? I was in my therapy and I actually asked my therapist to sit on me and lock and and don't let me get up because I really had problem with anger. I was so afraid of anger and uh, so I finally decided to go to my sister and ask her if she would come back with me to the lion's den so I can look at the enemy and assign the shame and guilt to the perpetrator. And she told me I'm an idiot. And so I I did go, but I didn't have Magda with me. And I was able to really scream it out so I hope that you can do that too. You can always scream in a car. No one hears you. You just scream it out and you'll feel better because what comes out of your body, uh, your, your body will never make you ill. Mm-hmm. Do you feel you changed after that experience? Absolutely. I think I changed the, the anger to pity. I felt sorry for the guards. Mm. I think it's important to to acknowledge that time. People say time change. I don't think time changes anything. It's what you do with the times. That's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm also curious, why do you accept so many interviews? Because that's such that's such a privilege to like creators like like myself to be able to have this conversation. Because I don't have time to hate. Hmm. 
That's awesome. I think someone said that, one of the psychiatrists said that, I think it was Rollo May, maybe, who said the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. I'd rather be hated than overlooked. Because when you hate me, I got something there that uh, <laughs> could be looked at as, as an asset, not a liability. And I think Auschwitz was a wonderful classroom to really learn how not to ever allow to be a victim. Hmm. I was victimized. It's not my identity. It's not who I am. It's what was done to me. That's important. How, how do you think um, more people can have this, m this mindset of that their identity is not what happened to them? It's you, you kind to yourself that you change what you can change. I think the if you alcoholic, you go to a 12 step program and they talk about appreciating what you have and, uh, and the wisdom to know the difference, that one. I think that's very wise, very wise hmm. to think about your thinking and pay attention what you're paying attention to. It's very good to pay attention what you focus on because what you focus on has to be in alignment and close to get you to your goal. So set your goals and then pick an arrow that you follow. Like when I came from Germany to America, I know there was a big storm in a British area and, and the ship changed routes but then we didn't go to China or wherever we would have gone. But, uh, Sorry. Uh, then uh, we came back and yes, I saw the Statue of Liberty and we came from Germany to Bremenhaven, from Bremenhaven to the Statue of Liberty. What? I remember uh the Statue of Liberty, uh, Liberty and I thought, in 1949, I came to America. The only word I knew was okay. Everything was okay. Mm. Uh, you told me, and then you wanted to know whether I get it, and I nodded that I do, even when I didn't. I didn't want you to look at me that I'm s such a dummy. Mm. Uh, but thank God, I speak English well now, and. Uh, I remember also that unfortunately, when I worked in a factory, I worked piecework. That means you get paid by the dozen. I got seven cents cutting of threads of boxer shorts, little boys, okay? But when I went to the bathroom, one of them said colored, and I didn't understand that I came to America hoping to find democracy and what do I find? Prejudice. Mm. So I gathered the women of color and then I met Martin Luther King in Washington and a woman with two men singing, we shall overcome. It's called the mamas and the papas. I don't know whether they're still alive. You can look it up and tell them I was there. I think it's 1962 or 63, one of those. That's amazing. Um, yes. I'm sure that the language- My grandmother would have remembered. I'm yes. sure that, that the language barrier has been uh, challenging. What else has been difficult when you moved from Europe to America? Well, uh, people eat breakfast here. <laughs> In Europe, I just had a little something, uh, but here you better have your bacon and eggs or whatever you wanna eat 
because uh, because that's America. You you probably eat in the morning uh, what people usually eat at night. A lot of the times, you you have meat, you have eggs, you have you have a complete meal. The biggest meal actually is uh, you eat like a king for the breakfast, like a prince for lunch, and like a pauper in the evening. Yeah. They're yeah. not going to gain weight. That's so true. Um, what, what do you think that has changed after publishing the books? Oh, honey, I, I couldn't be happier to tell you. That's the best thing I did. And I hope you do it too. Write a book. And it's going to be in your grandchildren's or great grandchildren living room table. That's where my book is. I have I have twin great grandson. Noah and Dylan, and my book is on that table. That is that is something I highly recommend. Start writing every day. And I think you can really control your time between working, loving, and playing. Mm. Have a balance. How long did it take for you to write this box? A lifetime. I have yet to arrive. I'm still climbing the mountain and, and sleeping and climbing, but I never stop climbing. Mm -hmm. um, I am evolving, not revolving. That's beautiful. Um, I think Jesus had a lot to do with it when he said, turn the other cheek, you know, because now I look at the same thing, but from a different perspective, uh, different pair of glasses. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't set yourself up and say, that's me. You, the you that you choose, you can, you can change from moment to moment, mm -hmm. hour by hour, day by day. Try the side door, try a different way of uh, starting the day. And by the way, it's very good to be a good mother to you. Mm. So anything you want to say, ask yourself, is it necessary? Is it uh, important? But most of all, is it kind? I practice that all the time when I have uh, dinner with my children. If I want to say something, I ask myself whether it's important, necessary, but most of all, is it kind? That is so important. Um, how do you find peace with what happened to you? I think when good people do bad things, They need to question authority rather than blindly ever adhere to authority. And when a country doesn't win the war and then a country is hungry, that's when they look for scapegoats. And I think the Jewish people were, I was called a pariah uh, and cancer to society. And... Uh, So in Vietnam, I think we were not killing people, we were killing gooks. And Germany, you, you were killing kikes. You know, you give them a name and then that makes them subhuman. Less than rather than better than. Yeah. I'm not better than or less than anybody else. I'm one of a kind. You know what? There'll never be another you. Isn't that exciting? It is. It is exciting. Um, and with all this energy that you have after these two books, what comes mm -hmm. next for you? A book for teenagers. Oh, that's amazing. 
teenagers don't know, you know, they're not children anymore, they're not adults. It's a very difficult time of life to be a teenager. I think teenagers need um, a good direction, working, loving, and playing. So first you do what you don't like to do. Does it come... Um... Don't say, I think about it tomorrow, like Scarlett O'Hara. I think about it, don't think about it tomorrow. Just do it today, get it done, what you don't like, and then you have free time. That's, that's amazing. Um, does it get easier to write books or is it always challenging? Yes, I, I think you actually are hungry to write things down, what goes in your mind and, uh, and you're good to yourself and you're a good mom to you to say, okay, you're going to write from nine to 10 or whatever time and nothing can interrupt that. Mm. So separate the have tos and the want tos. That's such what a... we have to do, things without which we cannot survive. So you have to breathe. We need air. We're not surviving after maybe four minutes, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Is there any other routines that you that you like in your day-to-day -day life? The routines, uh, I love to take a shower and I feel so much cleaner. Uh, and uh, of course, that also includes fresh underwear and, you know, just kind of starting the day with uh, something lovely because my father was a tailor and he became actually a couturier and told me when I grow up, I'll be the best dress girl in town. So that's what I said, Daddy, I'm dressing up for you. That's very nice. Um, that's a wonderful feeling. Is there any book that you really enjoyed? I think the book... Uh, by Dalai Lama and Tutu um, are a beautiful pair of men that I admire and how they treat each other with respect. Respect is more important. It's very hard to respect someone because when, when the phone rings and you tell your uh, mother, father, that the phone is for you very quietly, they tell you, tell them I'm not here. And then, then you know that that person says one thing and does another, which may be a, a hypocrite. And so I think respect to me is very, very, very important that the best thing for children is a happy parents that they don't put each other down. They, uh, they can be angry, but they don't have to blame anyone to take freedom with responsibility. Mm -hmm. Freedom without responsibility is anarchy. So be careful with freedom. It has a price tag attached. When we were liberated, I knew that people were walking out. I was too ill to even walk. I was watching people getting out, and after a while, they would come back. Dr. Seligman talks it about learned helplessness. Even when we were free, we didn't know what to do with the freedom. So we go back to the familiar. And many times women do that. The husband beats them, they leave. Okay. Um, so my next question is, um, are there any limiting beliefs 
that you got rid of these last few years? I limit uh, judging people um, totally. I uh, I look at everyone as a human being that will never be another one like you. I I respect people, not judging them whether they're rich or poor or anything. I expect people to practice respect as much as possible and not labeling anyone. Hmm. It is. Um, I don't care the labels. It is so inspiring to hear you talk that I'm wondering if you ever had bad days because it seems like you're so smart with such a good energy that it's truly inspiring. I wouldn't call it bad days. I would probably call it uh, um, not having enough excitement <laughs> as usual, uh, kind of blah. blah. Mm -hmm. So I, I entertain myself. I dance around the house. I, I like jazz. I like the big band. The children call it supermarket music. <laughs> um, and, and, and I like Tommy Dorsey. I like Glenn Miller. That's my speed. That's beautiful. Um, to anybody listening, um, what would you say it's so important that you pay attention to what you put in your mind? I, I may not preach, I hope, uh -huh. but I say, think before you say anything, whether it is important, whether it is really necessary. I think it's good to think about your thinking and pay attention, what you're paying attention to, because any behavior you pay attention to, you reinforce that behavior. So if I would come to you and tell you after this that I really like you and I want you to be my friend, and you tell me, you know, it's okay, please, no friendship. Now, the word rejection is an English word that people make up to express a feeling when you don't get what you want. So give up the drama. No one can reject me but me. Mm. I just wanted something and I didn't get it. Now, which God said that I should get what I want, when I want it, how I want it. I think all has to do with your expectation to be realistic, not idealistic. Because when the idealists come and they don't find what they're looking for, they become very cynical, sarcastic. Hungarian men can do a good job on you with sarcasm and cynicism. Okay. Um, what would you say it's your day-to-day -day success definition for a good life? I think the word let's is very bossy. Let's means do what I want you to do. I, I stay away from let's and stay with the I feel, I think, I would like, I'm willing. Just stay with the I. Because let's means, you know, let's go to the movies. That means, you know, I, I, I think you have to come to the movies because well, you don't have to go to the movies. But you can say, I like to come. Sunday morning to a matinee at 11 o'clock and then have breakfast. You know, you can, you can ask for what you want and then you learn to negotiate and compromise. Mm. You said this before, but I'm going to ask this to you now. How do you want to be remembered? Because I feel like it's such a good question. I want to be remembered 
as someone who went through hell and did everything in her power that will never happen again. I am very much into prevention, but not to forget it or fight it. And that's why I went back to Auschwitz. So you revisit the places where you've been, you relive that experience, but you don't set up household there. You revise your life. So don't try to go back, have a new beginning. So pretend you're pregnant and you're going to give birth to the you that was meant to be free. Mm. Freedom is everything. Freedom from the concentration camp. The biggest one is in your own mind and the key is in your pocket. I really love this, um, this story that I had on the, on the book um, when you were, after you studied psychology and you were thinking about doing the PhD and you said, um, I don't know if I'm going to do it because I'm going to be 50 when I'm done with it. And this answer that you got from it, I feel like it's, it's perfect for anybody which says, I'm going to be 50 anyways, either if yeah. I do it or not. Yes, yes. My supervisor said, they said you know, Edie, you'll be 50 anyway. Chronological age is going to happen. You might as well grow with it and let go of the things that are not really bringing you any more, anything to grow from. And just uh, uh, go to the backyard and take a shovel and write down uh, maybe one failure and then bury it and leave it there resting. Don't yank it up again. So it's good to do it now because Thanksgiving is coming up. What you're going to hold on to and what are you willing to let go of? I think that's very, very important to wonder how you're going to be the best mother to you, the best parent to you. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that the change is synonymous with growth. Mm. Um, how are we going to close this interview? I'm going to... I want to give you a minute for like a last message to the people who are listening to us um, from Argentina and from all over Latin America. Um, I've recommended your book so many times that I just want to give you like a minute for a last message to the people listening so far. Don't try to be like anyone else. There is only one of you. God doesn't make junk. I hope you put a value on yourself. And if the guy wants to go to bed with you, you can say, you know what? I would like to go to bed with you too. And when I'm ready, you will be the first one to know. So might as well find out whether you're going to be friends or not, or, or he just wants to, you know, have a one night. I, know. I think it's important to be honest and tell a person what you want and what's in it for him, him or her or both, and uh, learn to negotiate and, of course, learn to compromise. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much for you're this. Welcome. I think you're an amazing woman of strength. You're a Renaissance woman, I'm going to call you. You are a woman for all seasons. You're wise, not smart. You're wise. You are so, so wise. This whole yeah. interview was so wise. I am glad to talk to you and hope to be a good role model to you. 
I don't have time to hate. I must mean I love everything and everyone. You know, I had a young man who told me he was going to kill all the Jews. And I know that there is a difference between reacting or responding. Because if I would have reacted, I would have taken him to the corner and tell him that I saw my mother going to the gas chamber. But that I was not taught to do. I was taught to create an environment that a person can feel any feelings without the fear of being judged. And I think that's what you are, a great role model that people can feel any fever, any, and any feelings without the fear of being judged by you. You're a non-judgmental person who can love and not to question so much, but rather be helpful and useful to everyone. So you're an ambassador for peace and goodwill. Mm. Thank you so much for writing this book so we can all learn from you. I enjoy it. And we all have it in our living room tables. Thank um, you, honey. And I love your dimples. Thank you so much. You have cute dimples. Thank you so, so much. Gracias por escuchar este capítulo. Si tenés una amiga o amigo que le pueda gustar, reenvíáselo que nos ayuda a crecer. Todas mis reflexiones mientras construyo Tiene que haber algo más están en el correo semanal en tiene que haber algo más .com barra correo. Todos los links de lo que hablamos están en tiene que haber algo más .com y mándame tus comentarios por redes sociales. Nos vemos la semana que viene.